Dave? Yeah, so here's the title of the talk. Um, I was gonna give a kind of a big survey, but I think I'll, instead I'll just, uh, I wanna focus a little bit on holonomy perturbations because I think they're cool and, uh, and so, and I, I would like to get across the idea that they're not um, super tricky. I mean, they can be, but uh, there's some interesting stuff to look at. So um, let me start with a main definition that you, you should remember. I'll be using this during the entire talk. Uh, so if you have um, some kind of co-dimension two submanifold A inside of B, then uh, I want to assign to that pair uh, the, something I'll call chi of, um, chi of AB, which is a, um, the SU2 traceless character variety of that pair. So, um, so what you do is you remove the submanifold A from, uh, from B, and then you um, look at all the homomorphisms from the fundamental group of that complement into SU2 that happen to take every meridian to a traceless element in SU2. So that's the main character in this talk. And um, we'll take them up to conjugation as usual. And the, this picture just shows you the two situations that you'll have to think about. One is if uh, A is a nod or a link in a three manifold or more generally a tangle in a three manifold with boundary, properly embedded union of circles and arcs. Then for any meridian, um, you ask that uh, the holonomy, that the representation rho takes that meridian to an element in SU2 with trace zero. So here's a, here's a picture, maybe here's the base point. Um, don't have a laser pointer on this program, but here's the base point and uh, got one meridian maybe to one component of A and another meridian to another component of A. And I just, I only want to consider the homomorphisms that happen to take those meridians to traceless matrices. Here's an example in a surface. So I want, I want to think a little bit about the cobordism category perspective. So um, if you um, look at the restriction, that is to say, given a homomorphism on the three manifold, you can just restrict it to the boundary two manifold. And in this case, the two manifold is a surface with boundary. Sorry, surface with punctures or with um, perhaps with lab uh, with some marked points on it. It might be the correct way to say it. But you, you'll take the um, punctures out and then you'll end up with a punctured surface. And the, by definition, the meridians are just little loops that go once around each corner. So there may be some other fundamental group around, like maybe this loop. And may, that loop would put no restrictions on. But the ones that go around the boundary components will require that they be traceless. Okay, so that's the main thing. And I'll refer to this uh, frequently. And I'll remind you of it as we go along. Here's kind of a, an attempt to give you, uh, looks a little sloppy though when I look at it now, uh, uh, a picture of what's going on and what this talk is about. So starting on the left, um, you might uh, start by thinking about um, closed manifolds, closed three manifolds. Maybe uh, it, eventually links in closed three manifolds. And um, what we learned from uh, Taubes's uh, reinterpretation of Casson's invariant was that you could uh, study the Morse theory of uh, the Chern-Simons function and um, it produces a chain complex whose homology is called the instanton homology. And, uh, Fleur introduced this uh, using the idea of uh, Taubes. And the, maybe the important thing I wanna point out about this construction and its explanation why that instanton theory of say Kronheimer and Rovka is so well uh, developed is that you don't need a Hagar decomposition for uh, uh, to define this. Um, 
you have to worry about the Morse theory and you have to, and that's, I'll talk about that a little bit, but the point is that in contrast to something like Hagard Fleur or, or, uh, or Casson's original definition of his invariant, um, a technically a, a, a technical reason why instanton homology is was is developable is because uh, you don't have to decompose uh, manifold into pieces and so you don't have to deal at least initially with uh, boundary value problems in analysis um, now to extend this a little bit um, so maybe in what this slide is meant to suggest is that an idea, and it's, it's, it's what underlies the atf floor conjecture, but maybe it's a, a more sort of meta idea in modern uh, low dimensional topology, is that one way to try to produce uh, invariants for three manifolds is by a process that I've broken down into three steps here. The first is you start with uh, some kind of um, coborism category. So, may, so that's a fancy way of saying you begin with um, in this case I'm going to start with three manif compact three manifolds with boundary containing some link entangled properly embedded not necessarily connected one manifold and if you'd like to produce invariants of that then um, you can think of that as going through process where you first pass to it's character variety in the sense that I defined a minute ago. Here's sort of a reminder of what uh, of what that def what that is. But um, you start with you take the character variety and you end up in something called the symplectic category. So it's a fact that goes back to Goldman and uh, Atiyah Bot uh, that if you have a two dimensional manifold. Its character variety is admits a natural symplectic form, or at least the top smooth stratum of its character variety admits a uh, symplectic form. And if you have a um, three manifold whose boundary is a surface, then you can look at the character variety of that three manifold, and it provides you with a Lagrangian sub variety of, uh, well, a Lagrangian immersion into. Uh, into the symplectic manifold. So I've tried to highlight that a little bit in this uh, in this thing right here. That um, I'll return to this. This is an idea due to Weinstein. Um, you think of a category whose objects are symplectic manifolds, and whose morphisms are Lagrangian immersions into the product of the two symplectic manifolds. Maybe you'll take a, you'll take a. a the negative symplectic form on the first component. And then the way you compose it is uh, kind of tricky. I'll, I'll come to that eventually, but what's nice about composition is that it's compatible. This functure here is compatible with the Seifert Van Kampen theorem. I mean, the way we say this is that composition is given by fiber products, but the Van Kampen theorem tells us that if we look at character varieties of um, manifolds decomposed along surfaces, then the way the we form the character variety by gluing or is by composing in this category, the symplectic category. So it's a it's a nice idea, and I'm going to discuss this for the rest of the talk after I tell you that. Of course, the the point is that this is an intermediate step, and um, the final step then would be to apply the very well developed uh, Lagrangian Fleur theory to produce invariance out of this. So I probably won't say much. But if I have time at the end, I'll mention how uh, the main theorem I want to talk about, about one example of this, um, can give uh, information about, uh, well, perhaps uh, things involving Kabanov homology or um, things involving rap, the rap for Kai category. And maybe in a more ambitious sense, um, the idea here is to Imagine, uh, you know, some future where um, instanton homology now has a bordered uh, counterpart. And so one way to say what I might be trying to do is compute one non-trivial morphism in some bordered theory. Okay, so that's, that's uh, enough abstract nonsense. Let's get to, um, let's get to the uh, 
uh, topic. So here's a warm up exercise that um, should be familiar to uh, anyone uh, over 60, anyone under 60 is what I meant to say. And um, the exercise is just a, this fact that we all know that cylinders, that is, if you take a surface and cross it with an interval, this should induce the identity on any sort of topological quantum field theory. So let's see how this plays out in this meta diagram here, uh, as far as this, uh, this character variety functor goes. So let's do it in a very simple case. So I'm gonna take uh, my surface to be a four punctured sphere. And um, so I wanna form a cylinder with that. So I'll just take the four punctured sphere and cross it with an interval. And I get this tangle. Here's kind of a schematic of it, but let me draw a, a more, a, a more understandable picture. So here's it's the same picture, but I've drawn it as a planar tangle. So I've got in the three sphere, I remove two balls. And uh, in the equatorial two sphere, I put these four uh, blue arcs. So that's an example of a tangle. It's in fact the product tangle uh, where the two manifold in question is, uh, I'll, I'll notate it uh, by S24. So that's the boundary is a four, is a two sphere with four marked points. That set of four points, I'll just call it uh, the number four. And then the three manifold is the product of these. And um, so uh, we'd like to know, like, so I mean, we know philosophically that we'd like to see uh, this as a cobordism that induces the identity. And so how does that manifest itself in this particular uh, approach to, uh, to producing, uh, to, with respect to this functor of taking character varieties. Well, uh, it works like this. I'll, I'll just show you. Uh, um, if you look at the inclusion of, let's say, one boundary component into the product, well, that inclusion induces an isomorphism on, on fundamental groups, as does the inclusion of the other uh, component. So we have these two inclusion maps that are uh, indicated right here. And then when you apply the uh, functor HOM into SU2, since that's a contravariant functor, it gives us a map of topological spaces or of real algebraic varieties that goes the other way. And here's the picture of it. So um, it'll take the character variety of the three manifold and map it to the product of the character varieties over each boundary component. Because if you have a disconnected space, the proper definition of its flat moduli space would be the product of all its, uh, the moduli spaces of its, each of its path components. Now, um, the, the, the focus on this space comes from the fact that the space of traceless representations of a four punctured sphere is itself homeomorphic to a two sphere with four distinguished points. It's a little bit confusing, but in this lecture, there's gonna be two four punctured spheres. One is the two sphere with four points on it, and the other will be its moduli space, which I'll call the pillowcase. So to distinguish the two, the, the two manifold from its moduli space, I'll call the two manifold S2, and I'll call its moduli space, the pillowcase. So, okay, so back to this trivial example, because this map is, the inclusion map uh, on fundamental groups is, an, is isomorphism, in fact, the identity uh, from uh, both ends of this trivial cobordism, that translates into the statement that this restriction map is just the diagonal map, in this case, from the pillowcase to a product of two pillowcases, or from a two sphere to a product of two spheres. Now the diagonal map is a from a 
from x to x cross x is another name for the graph of the identity function. And so this, in this way, we see that the identity is the induced map. Um, after passing from our topological category to our uh, symplectic category, I've given you an example of one particular morphism here, namely a uh, cylinder. And we've checked that it's giving us something that looks like the graph of the identity map. And that's, uh, that's exactly uh, what this chi is supposed to do. Okay. All right, so that's, that was our warm up exercise. And um, now let me say that, why is this interesting? One of the things you can think of here is if you have a planar tangle, you could put in some kind of, uh, you can fill in the balls with different things. And um, so from a tangle, you can build a knot or a link in some three manifold. And the, stand, the basic fact is that the composition in the symplectic character, in the symplectic category corresponds to uh, gluing over on the cobordism category. So you could glue in these, um, for example, these things and um, produce a knot or link and maybe try to understand its character variety by breaking it up into pieces. Okay, so here's the trivial uh, product tangle. And let's, so this, this talk is really about another tangle, which is this tangle right here. So um, let me tell you what the theorem is. So this is a theorem uh, of uh, Guillaume Casasus, uh, Chris Harold, Artem Kotelsky, and myself. And um, so you should look at this picture and see that trivial tangle I had up there before. So S2 cross I is in this picture, but um, three extra pieces uh, are present. There are two, uh, there's a red and a green curve. Those are perturbation curves and I'll explain what those are in a second. So for the moment, erase those from your uh, mental, image and just look at, um, at uh, maybe just focus on, um, on this component here. So this is an example of what uh, I guess uh, Kronheimer and Rofka call adding an atom. And in this case, it's a particular kind of atom that, that I've been calling an earring. I don't know if, uh, if uh, you know, if that's the right terminology. But anyway, um, it corresponds to taking some strand of your knot or tangle, putting first picking some point on it, like, uh, like this point here, in the middle, and then uh, adding to your tangle a small meridian around your strand at that point. And then there's a little uh, technicality that I'll sweep under the rug, but this is meant to, there's a little arc here that's meant to specify uh, a non-trivial SO3 bundle. I wanna stick to SU2 in this talk, so I won't say much about this, but probably many of you know, uh, uh, well, I mean, the basic idea here is that this arc is meant to be the Poincaré dual to a two-dimensional uh, Z2 cohomology class which represents a second Stiefel Whitney class of some underlying SO3 bundle. But if that didn't make sense, so you just think about taking the tangle I gave you a minute ago, this one, and just putting an earring, putting an extra component around this here, and then somehow twisting the bundle locally near this fact. That's what that little arc is telling us to do. Okay, so um, there's a tangle. It's, I, so I wanna think of this as a morphism in some tangle category. It's a morphism from the four punctured sphere, perhaps this one, to this one. And so when we apply our character variety functor, just like we did before, we, we should expect to get a morphism in the symplectic category from this, the, 
moduli space, the character variety of this sphere, which is a two sphere, it's, a, it's the pillowcase, to the pillowcase corresponding to this variety. So if you like, after the product um, tangle, this is maybe the next tr trivialistest uh, tangle that I could think of anyway. And um, so I'd like to explain to you how we figured out what this, uh, or with the, I'm gonna to explain to you what the induced morphism is in this case, when we pass to the symplectic category. And my, I think my main point is to convince you that um, from here on, you don't need to know anything besides the verting or presentation, maybe a little bit about spherical geometry to uh, finish the calculation. So um, here's, a, uh, here's the tangle, we've put an earring on it, and now comes the thing that I find uh, kind of cool is the uh, notion of holonomy perturbation. So I've got two curves, a green curve and a red curve. Here's a red curve. And um, along those curves, I will holonomy perturb. So the, what that means is I will replace the character variety that you would calculate if you didn't have those two curves, green and red curve, by a nearby one in a certain sense, or maybe a nearby smooth fiber in some family, uh, some fibered family. And um, with luck, the nearby smooth fiber, the nearby fiber will be nicer. And, um, and in this case, it does, it is nicer and has some very nice properties, which I'd like to explain. So first, a statement of the theorem. So take this tangle and let's look at the representations. I'll, I'll write this, let's see if I write it, if I have this written down somewhere. Um, Yeah, I'll, I'll specify uh, what that is. I'll give you a, a better definition in a minute, but look at the traceless character variety of this uh, perturbed along these two curves. And there's a per perturbation parameter, uh, one perturbation parameter S, which I will uh, introduce in a few minutes. But here's a statement of the theorem that if you apply these two perturbations and look at the resulting traceless character variety, uh, it turns out to be a smooth genus three surface. And um, the second part of the theorem, which is really kind of the hardest part, is the identification of the restriction map of this smooth surface to the boundary pillowcases. So if you think back to the warm up exercise, we had a picture, we had a, a situation like this, um, where we, were we found a, a diagonal embedding of a two-sphere in a product of two spheres, or the diagonal embedding of the pillowcase in a product of two pillowcases. And we interpret that to mean that the induced morphism is the identity because it's the diagonal is the graph of the identity map. And so to understand what the induced morphism might be here, in the symplectic category or eventually in the Fukaya category, we would, um, first thing we have done is in this first part, we've identified what the domain is. It's a genus three surface. And uh, this is a pair of, uh, this is a product of two two spheres, the moduli space of the boundary. And so there's a restriction map given a homomorphism on the, the three manifold, just look at its restriction to the boundary. And uh, that restriction map, so here's the statement. It's a Lagrangian bifold immersion. I'll describe this, but it's related to the Whitney's classification of uh, maps, uh, singularities of maps from a two manifold to a two manifold. So it's a certain kind of uh, immersion. It, uh, it has uh, singularities when you project onto each of the two factors. So it's an immersion as a map into the four manifold, S2 cross S2. But if you project onto the two factors, you get a map from a genus three surface to a two sphere. 
that map is generic and uh, stable. And in fact, it's the following map. So here's a picture that describes the second part of this theorem. So in pink, you see a genus three surface. That's the perturbed character variety of the tangle that I drew a minute ago, the product tangle with an earring attached and the two perturbations turned on. So I'm assuming S here is non-zero. And um, so you should see this as a genus three surface. Think about a, a pair of parallel two spheres and I've put four uh, handles between them. And I can map that down to a two sphere just uh, in the manner indicated here. So, um, so there's a, a map, uh, sorry. There's a restriction map. You can see that it's not surjective. In fact, its image is, um, you know, is everything away from these four points in the pillowcase, which, uh, which indeed are singular or orbifold points if you think of them uh, carefully. So uh, part of the usefulness, and I'll come back to this, uh, of the, this conclusion is that not only is this a smooth manifold, uh, but its map to, its restriction map is actually uh, the following. So it's a product. Yeah, so here, this, this restriction map, it's the product of its two projections. But it turns out that they're both of this form. And now uh, here's the only, here's something that's easy to understand. And if you get it, you should be okay for the rest of the talk. So um, I want to describe a map from a genus three surface to a pair of two spheres. And what I've done in this picture is described a map from a genus three surface to a single two sphere namely this fold, this Whitney fold. There's a fold along this set. So the function is not an immersion along these four circles. These four circles are mapped to this. That's what the projection to the first factor is. How about to the second factor? Well, it's the same thing, except you should first perform a single Dane twist around each of those four yellow curves. So uh, here's maybe a different perspective on, uh, on this map. So here's, a, here's the same picture I just drew, but perhaps in a more elementary way. So here's a genus three surface. And I'm gonna map it to a two sphere by first you know, folding this surface along those four circles. So think of like a, you know, you've got that genus three surface made out of cloth and you just kind of stick your, stick four fingers in and, and push them in. So, so this is a two to one map, except along those circles where it's one to one. And then uh, just include that in the pillowcase, like put a, a, a glove on the pillowcase with its singular points uh, sticking out. So that's uh, one map. The fold here is, uh, uh, this is a concept due to Whitney. It's a stable map from a two manifold to a two manifold. And it's just a map X, Y that can be written in local coordinates as X, Y goes to X squared and Y squared. And the entire map that we're interested in is the product. So let me put it here because I didn't say it. So R, so the theorem is that R is equal to R plus cross R minus composed with this thing twist. So it's an explicit identification of this moduli space together with its restriction to the boundary. And uh, um, let, me, uh, let me explain that. Let me tell you a little bit more about that particular calculation. So let's back up. Um, here's a picture of the tangle again with the two perturbation curves. 
But again, I want you to remove the green and red curve from your vision. And uh, what you should see is a purple annulus in the complement of our tangle, an incompressible annulus. And um, one of the basic facts about character varieties is that the presence of incompressible surfaces has the tendency to make the character variety have excessive dimension. So it would, it, 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 it permits the character variety to have, say, the, a dimension larger than what its formal expected dimension would be, say, from an index theoretic point of view. Um, from, a, from the gauge theory point of view, uh, the way you say this is that you can, there's some gluing parameters you can use when you're trying to glue connections along, along a, um, trying to glue flat connections along an annulus. There tend to be gluing parameters and these give rise to the wrong dimension of moduli space. Um, and so at the very least, if we're going to succeed in making this a nice uh, character variety, then one of the things we know is we need to find some perturbation curves that pierce every incompressible annulus and torus. In this case, there are no, no incompressible tori, but that pierce through every incompressible annulus or torus. Otherwise, we would not expect to get a Lagrangian immersion of the right dimension. And in fact, in this case, if you don't perturb at all, it's sort of a general feature in the kronheimer murovka theory. When you put these atoms, you get all sorts of nice things out of it, like you eliminate uh, some st reducible strata and so forth. But the price you pay is that these gluing parameters appear that you have to uh, deal with. There's another incompressible annulus. If you you can see that that surrounds the earring here, I can put a I think of a two sphere here that intersects the tangle in two points. So that's also an incompressible um, annulus if you remove this neighborhood. And so you see that whenever you place this atom or this earring on one of the strands, you immediately leave the generic world. Uh, uh, that is to say the world where your moduli spaces have the dimension you want them to have. Uh, in fact, let me just tell you that it's it's an easy exercise. In fact, if you don't worry about the perturbation curves, but you just look at the tangle with the earring itself, it's easy to tell that it's moduli space, it's flat traceless moduli space, is, well, it's obtained from a cipher fibered, cipher fibered, cipher fibered three manifold over the two sphere with four singular fibers to a, uh, each of them of index two. That's a smooth three manifold, but take it and collapse those four singular fibers each to a point. So you get some sort of singular three manifold that singularities um, have neighborhoods that are cones on a torus. So A, it's not a two dimensional manifold. So we're not gonna get a Lagrangian immersion. We'll get a map from a three manifold into the product of two spheres. So that's, that's something, that's a feature that will always be true when you add one of these atoms. That's the price you pay for, um, for eliminating, in this case, central or uh, uh, reducible strata. So our perturbation curves necessarily must pierce all separating annuli, otherwise, that's just not gonna happen. There's a process called bending in, uh, that, that tells you if you have two represent, if you have two SU2 representations of, if you have a, a manifold decomposed along a surface, a three manifold decomposed along a surface and two SU2 representations of the pieces, you can glue them together if they agree on the overlap. But if there's some stabilizer on the overlap, there's some ambiguity in how you glue. And so to eliminate that possibility, we must perturb along at the very minimum curves that pierce all incompressible annuli. And for this tangle, 
you can't get away with, well, perhaps you could get away with one curve, but if you're gonna use one curve, it would have to be really complicated and wind around everywhere. And I'd like to be able to compute this using Vertinger presentations in standard uh, knot theory and not get the too many generators. And so it turns out that the most efficient way to find perturbation curves at Pearsall separating annuli is to pick these two curves, or at least that those are the ways we found. Now it turns out um, that that's not quite enough. And um, so let me make a few more general comments about holonomy perturbations. Usually the way they're invoked in, uh, in our discipline is that um, some, uh, some machinery is developed. In this case, I'm thinking of uh, singular instanton homology. And along the way, some kind of a abundance or generosity theorem is proved that says that um, although your moduli spaces are all not always of um, the same dimension or the same or smooth manifolds of the type predicted by say index formulas, one can find holonomy perturbations to guarantee that is true. And then once with the existence of those in place, then you can go ahead and define, uh, define your invariance. But I, I'm more interested in the question of just maybe the art of finding those perturbation curves themselves, because um, knowing that you can smooth a moduli space is not the same as knowing exactly what that moduli space is and how it maps. You can get some information, but uh, but there's certain things that are not, uh, that don't just follow abstractly. I mean, one particular one that uh, that's always uh, puzzled me is that if your moduli happen space happens to be a circle, let's say you had a closed three manifold and it's flat moduli space contained a component Maybe it's a bot Morse uh, component of the singular set of the Chern Simons function. And you might want to know that you can perturb the Chern Simons function a little bit to get to turn that circle into a pair of points. So, probably that's not so hard to do, but a priori, how do you know, even if you know that you can perturb a circle into a, a, into a, a finite set of critical uh, points? it's not always so clear that you can perturb by holonomy perturbations in a way to get just two points. In this particular case, that same principle applies, but is a little more tricky. If you think about this ciphered fiber, the ciphered vibration. So what's really happening is that we have this three manifold almost mapping to the two sphere. And it's the wrong dimension because it's fibers or circles. We'd like the fibers to be discrete so that we end up with a surface. And so uh, another consideration in finding the right perturbation curve is that um, we need um, a, these holonomy curves have to be perturbed in such a way to guarantee that each of those circles will get turned into, well, that the restriction, well, let me, it's a little hard to say, but here's the most efficient way to say that. If you look at the trace of the holonomy around the perturbation curves, those should provide um, fiber-wise Morse functions on this three manifold. Now there's no theorem that says if you can do this, it'll work, but it, this is more of a principle that if it's gonna work, you're gonna need to be able to do this. And so uh, we searched around. So the, the way we came up with these two curves was we had to first pierce all the incompressible annuli, but that turned out not to be enough. And so in general, if you're looking for a collection of perturbation curves, a minimal, simple collection of perturbation curves to smooth your character variety, uh, your main consideration, your primary consideration should be making sure they cut through all the incompressible tori and annuli in, in your space. But that's not enough. There's a, a second uh, level of consideration, which is that you want the perturbation to actually accomplish uh, the task of the smoothing the character variety. And um, I, I think of this as a fiber-wise version of, uh, of a theorem that uh, Chris and Hans um, 
proved in the, in one of their connected some I think in their connected some uh, formula for SU three cas invariant paper. So there they did the index zero part, or another way to say it, they did the closed manifold situation, and here we're dealing with uh, a more complicated situation. Okay. So let's talk a little about, about holonomy perturbations. So this is a concept due to Taubes, uh, or at least that's how I think of it. Although in, in the paper where Taubes introduces it, he uh, attributes the idea to Donaldson. Uh, Donaldson had something similar in his orientation of Yang Mills moduli space paper. So there he was doing perturbations um, in a four manifold. And in this case, we're doing uh, perturbations in a three manifold. Um, and um, now I haven't defined a perturbation for you, but except to say that it's something that's supposed to take the churn simons function, some kind of scalar valued function on an infinite dimensional manifold. And if that function happens not to be Morse, then a holonomy perturbation is some sort of compact or small perturbation of the churn simons function which hopefully has the property that it is Morse so that we can form the Morse chain complex. Now that formulation is hard to understand uh, from the point of view of just basic algebraic topology, but Taubes proved the little lemma in, in that paper that says that if you have something that satisfies the perturbed flat connections, the holonomy perturbed flat equations, then um, that's reflected on uh, on the level of holonomy representations by this um, by this uh, uh, formula right here. So this is the formula that eliminates all analysis and uh, differential geometry from the concept of a holonomy perturbation. It's saying this that. If you want to holonomy perturb the moduli space of a three manifold, your first step is to find some knot or link inside that three manifold. Your next step is to thicken it up so there's a framing that you have to pick. And once you have this solid torus embedded in your three manifold, well, simple Van Kampen argument says that the fundamental group of the three manifold you started with is obtained just by killing the meridians off. So if you remove a knot and then replace its meridians, you get back the same fundamental group as you, as you started with. But this time, rather than killing the meridians, we will make the meridians depend on the longitude in this complicated way that depends on a, um, on a parameter S. So when S is zero, this is just saying the unperturbed moduli space, is the moduli space, the flat moduli space, the space of representation, character variety that we're used to. But as you turn on S, the connections stop being flat in the little neighborhoods of those perturbation curves, but they do remain flat outside of them. That's fairly easy to see from the equations that uh, Taub's uh, introduced. And moreover, and this is a, just a beautiful little fact, the on the solid tori, the um, the representation has you know satisfies this property. So, what you're supposed to get away from this is that holonomy perturbations can be understood at least this kind, the kind along solid tori, can be understood completely in terms of um, fundamental group representations and not theory. Just the uh, the thing you have to do is you have to remove these curves from your, um, from your space, compute the fundamental group of the complement, and then, well, the stupid thing to do would be to kill the meridians of the green and the red curve, then you would have gotten back the space you started with. But instead of killing them, we let them depend slightly on the longitude. Let me uh, go back to, uh, to this picture here with the labeled, generators so you can see what I mean. So here's a picture that uh, if you've read Rolfson, you know how to calculate the fundamental group of the complement of this tangle 
in S2 cross I. You have uh, generators uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, W, Q, and P. Traceless, the traceless condition is going to tell us that we want C, D, G, H, P, A, F, all the meridians to be sent to traceless elements in SU2. But we are not going to require traceless for these uh, meridians of our perturbation curves. Instead, we're going to use the perturbation condition. So there's a hybrid. There's two types of co-dimension two submanifolds. There's the tangle itself and these auxiliary perturbation curves that are leading to the ambiguity that we all know about in Fleur theory. So the choice of these curves, the choice of perturbation ultimately snowballs into uh, the statement that we only get some sort of A infinity category of valued invariants. So let's go back to the reality here. Um, so here's the, uh, here's a pic, a color coded picture that explains what I just tried to say. So I've got the meridians. Each of those I will require to go to a traceless or here I'm, I'm going to convert to working with quaternions. So the trace it corresponds to the real part of the quaternion. So I want to look at the um, quaternion, unit quaternion valued representations that take each of the meridians to a purely imaginary quaternion. There's this W2 condition. So this little uh, purple arc should be sent to minus the identity in SU2. That's just specifying a particular non-trivial SO3 bundle. And then we have our two holonomy perturbation conditions that have to be satisfied for the green and the red curve. And those conditions establish a relationship that depends on a perturbation parameter between the meridians of the perturbation curves and the longitudes. And I've written the meridians here for you. You know, for example, the meridian of P, or excuse me, the longitude, the longitude of P would be, well, you start here and you go, see underneath this, so there's a, um, a B. Here's B, so you can see that's the same. And then it goes through H. So BH is the longitude for the red curve and uh, F A inverse H is the longitude for the green curve. Okay, so in summary, the theorem that we proved boils down to writing down a presentation for the fundamental group of this and finding one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight elements, eight traceless elements in SU2. The, the two sphere, it's a two sphere of traceless elements in the three sphere. SU2 is a three sphere. Um, and we want this generator, W, to go to minus one. And then we need these relations between P and Q uh, and, the and their longitudes to hold. So that's a, a list of conditions that you can place on a homomorphism from pi one of this tangle and perturbation complement into SU2. And the question is, what is it? And the answer is the configuration of all such up to conjugation is a smooth genus three surface. And it maps to the pillowcase in the way I described before. Okay, um, so I hope that gives you some idea. And, and again, my, I, I just wanna highlight the fact that these are the perturbation conditions. If you look at the more general types of perturbations, for example, the ones that uh, Kronheim and Rofka use where they um, perturb along, let's say instead of solid tori, we could say they perturb along handle bodies. Those are much more flexible and are very useful for proving genericity results. But uh, they're not, they don't have this explicit formula that we got from Taubes right here. Uh, and in a sense, they can't because 
unlike the moduli space for a torus, which is itself a pillowcase, the moduli space for higher genus surfaces is singular. And to describe Lagrangians in there is really, is tricky and it's, I mean, something that's studied, but uh, there, it, the there's not enough control to know, to be able to nail down exactly uh, what is happening on the boundary like this formula does for perturbing along solid tori. So that's the explanation for why, at least in our work, we tend to only perturb along, along a, a link as opposed to a more general perturbation, which might be better for genericity, but not so useful for calculation. Okay, let's see. Um, the proof uh, of this, I should say, is so, it, you know, the paper is kind of hard to read and we're reworking it a little bit now, but it's not, it's not deep. There's no uh, complicated ideas in it. Um, it's you, Verdinger presentations, uh, a lot of spherical geometry, which is really beautiful. It, it's really weird in this subject how, you know, you're, sometimes you argue by manipulating group uh, relations. Other times you argue by using specific facts about the geometry of the two spheres and three space. And uh, it's, at least for me, it's mind blowing. Like when I think about the uh, kronheimer uh, murovka uh, theorem that says that um, non-trivial knots have non-trivial SU2 representations. It's really weird when you're in the guts of this subject, it's, uh, it's, it's weird how a lot of your work is happening in SU2, not just in the three manifold group. And so, I don't know, I find it provocative to think about why, I mean, why is the kronheimer murovka theorem true? I mean, it's true because it's proved, but it's, hard. it's a hard theorem, as we know. Okay, let me finish just by uh, uh, listing a couple of related works. There's, there's a lot of things that, are, that I could relate to what I said, but I, I did want to advertise a little bit. One, um, uh, David Boozer has done a similar analysis for the following uh, tangle. So I gave you a theorem that identifies a perturbed flat moduli space and the restriction to the boundary for a four-stranded tangle in S2 cross I with an earring added and, and two perturbation curves. Boozer does a similar thing here, except his three manifold is a solid torus. His tangle starts out being just one, um, one trivial strand in your solid torus. Then he puts an earring on it. Uh, and I'll, if I have a few minutes at the end, I'll tell you, uh, one of the interesting consequences of that. And then finally he perturbs um, along this uh, core of the solid torus here, holonomy perturbance. So it's the, same, it's the same process for a different manifold. And in this case, what he proves is that the moduli space in question, the thing that takes, that, that plays the role of our genus three surface, in this case, it's a two sphere, a smooth two sphere. And the thing that plays the role of, in our theorem of the S2 cross S2, or the pillowcase cross the pillowcase, is actually more complicated in his case. So it's a, it's a, the character variety of a twice punctured torus is, is not quite as nice uh, as the character variety of a punctured sphere. In fact, he identifies it as a union of two pieces uh, four-dimensional pieces, one of which looks like uh, you, you take the product of two two spheres and remove its diagonal, and the other is something else, and Boozer does identify the image of his two sphere in this four manifold, so the Lagrangian immersion from the two, from the two sphere to the product of two two spheres. So it's a very similar result, and in his case he uses this to get estimates on, um, on uh, bounds on instanton homology for certain types of knots in lens spaces. Another uh, related work is uh, Kai Smith has looked at this tangle. So you can perhaps think about um, planar tangles if you wanted to study knot diagrams. Uh, so any knot diagram can be obtained by 
you know, projecting your knot and then putting a little uh, four punctured sphere around every crossing. Um, this uh, Kai calls a pretzel tangle because you can get pretzel knots by, uh, by plugging in rational tangles into those balls. And so he uses this to, um, so, so in this case, the uh, Lagrangian is gonna be some sort of a three dimensional object and the boundary will be a product of three two spheres because there are three boundary components. Each one contributes a pillowcase and uh, Kai identifies the, um, what that three manifold is. It's mildly singular and how it maps to the pillowcase. And from that is able to uh, get some uh, really uh, interesting estimates on instanton homology for number of knots, pretzel knots. Uh, you can also count bygones in, in some sort of proposed uh, theory called pillowcase homology. And it's quite interesting. Uh, uh, so he, he gets this very interesting examples. Let's see, uh, some, other, uh, some other things I wanna advertise just because these, you know, since I have the opportunity. Uh, Mark Ronenberg is looking at the, at generalizing uh, the ideas of Taubes uh, and, and also the things that Chris did in his thesis for three manifolds with boundary to the situation of surfaces with punctures that is to say to pr produce a pre-quantum line bundle over the moduli space of the surface with punctures in such a way that the Chern-Simons function on uh, tangles is defined and defines a, a, a parallel lift of this pre-quantum line bundle. Another uh, sort of uh, thing that's come out of this is that if you go back to the map that we described here, so I said that the restriction map was a Lagrangian bifold. So it's a map from a surface, in this case, a genus three surface, to a product of two surfaces, in this case, S2 cross S2. But you could ask in general, if I have a map from a two manifold into, let's say, a product of two surfaces, or maybe even into a left Schatz vibration, you could ask, what is the generic Lagrangian immersion look like? And it turns out that uh, what uh, Zhang proves is that uh, up to a Lagrangian regular homotopy, you can always make it generic in the sense of smooth singularity theory. That is to say, you can always make it have only fold singularities like this example has. And you can even make the folds, in this case, the folds are embedded, but you could, in general, the folds might be, um, the folds might be immersed curves. Uh, and so you can make them generically immersed. You can make them self-transverse. And so that hints at a way to study, um, especially if you apply the uh, Verheim Woodward uh, machinery, which is a way, a quilted floor homology machine, which is their uh, solution to, the, to producing floor invariants on the symplectic category. If you apply that, then it shows that at least in the case of surfaces mapping to products of surfaces, there's a chance of combinatorializing the situation because these are very rigid maps and they have very special topological features that perhaps enable you to avoid holomorphic disks, which um, of course is something that any topologist might want to do. Okay. Uh, and I'm out of time, so let me just uh, put up one last picture, which is the encapsulation of what our theorem says in maybe in modern language. And it says that the earring correspondence can be thought of as a function from Lagrangians in the pillowcase to itself. And it has two features. One, if you pick a curve that stays away from the corners, then the only thing that's happened is that that curve is doubled. On the other hand, if you happen to take a curve that starts and ends at one of the corners, it's not quite doubled, it's turned into a circle. And so one way to say this is that um, this gives a functor on the Fukaya category, on the wrapped Fukaya category of the pillowcase, which magically takes its values in the compact subcategory. 
And so if you're attempting to understand the Tia Fleur conjecture, you want to know what does putting one of these Kronheimer Morovka atoms do for you? Well, what it does is it moves you away from all the nasty points into the nice smooth part, this nice smooth locus of the um, character variety. And that's, that's good because then perhaps you can start looking for bygones and, uh, and polygons and find uh, sort of higher uh, mu maps that might reveal some interesting structure. And in fact, we did that in, in some other work that I don't have time to talk about, but, uh, but it does lead to connections with Kavanov homology and, uh, and, it's a, and ultimately it, you can think of what we're doing as kind of a baby version of what, um, what uh, Hanselman, Rasmussen, Watson, and then later Kotelsky, Watson, Zabrobius did on the level of bordered Hegard Fleur and bordered Kovanov. Okay, I'll stop here. Let's see if there are any questions. Are there questions? Um, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, hey, Ian, how you doing? Hey. Um, yeah, so I guess, uh, do you, what do you expect for, instead of looking at the like identity uh, tangle, like, I don't know, like a single crossing or maybe like more general uh, braid of some sort, maybe cups or caps? I didn't catch the end of your question. What do I expect for general tangles? And then- Yeah, or just like el elementary, uh like tangles like in the in, in s2 cross i um uh yeah so i i don't know how to give you a short answer to that question because <laughs> either the answer is i have no idea or i could tell you a bunch of stuff that might not be what you're asking um so uh let me just say that um what the, one of the things I didn't say, which underlies all this, is that the pillowcase, the character variety of, of both the torus and the four punctured sphere, is a two manifold. And Fleur theory is combinatorial in two manifolds, or is topological, it can be studied without ever referencing holomorphic disks, instead, just looking at immersions and differential topology. So that's sort of why we're focused on this. Um, there, the question of more complicated tangles quickly runs into this. So I'll answer your question by answering a completely unrelated and different question. But um, one of the things that uh, Kai uh, was telling me the other day is that if you could, um, maybe if you could do something like this, um, I won't get it quite right, but maybe a tangle, um, Yeah, I, I'm just going to draw maybe an example of a tangle. Oh, I don't, I don't think this is necessarily the one, but here's an example of a tangle. The boundary is uh, three two spheres. Two of them are two punctured, and one of them is, sorry, two of them are four punctured, and one of them is six punctured. And that six punctured guy I just don't know what to do with. There's some symplectic geometry that needs to be done. It's a, it's moduli space is not a smooth manifold. It's got isolated singularities and we, we know a lot about it, but as to whether Fleur theory makes sense in, in there, that's kind of a hard question. At least I don't have any idea to. And so any question about general tangles, probably if you were to ask me, I would say, well, are you talking about tangles, each of whose boundary components is a two sphere with four points on it? then you can say something. If you're gonna have two spheres with more than four points on it, then you're in a world where, I mean, there is there's some complete work of Verheim and Woodward in that situation and they have a well-defined theory, but it's not computable because ultimately it always boils down to trying to find holomorphic disks in a character variety. And that's, that's hard. Okay. 
I was I was actually asking a completely different question. But, yeah, uh, that was interesting too. Um, okay. <laughs> no, I I was just asking about like S two cross I with yeah. like the four strands, but like a single crossing between two of them in your setting with like the earring and like holonomy perturbations. Okay, so, yeah. So um, I mean, what? So if you're asking that question, like like maybe what if I did you know, I don't know, this. Yeah. You know, or maybe put some knot here or something like that. Yeah, so um, that, what I like about this point of view is that um, you can you can view that from the point of view of composition in the symplectic category. I didn't have time to talk about that, but I'm sure you know this business that when you, when you have, you know, flat moduli space on one manifold and the other, and you want to glue them together, it's not like you just take their product, you have to worry a little about how things work. And that's exactly what the Weinstein category does for you. And so if I wanted to do, if, if you were seriously asking me, how do you do this? The answer would be, well, I'd find some decomposition into simple pieces. Then I'd look and see whether any of those simple pieces have been analyzed in some previous article. And if so, I'm happy. And if not, then I do a pi one calculation, just like the one I outlined to you. So you'll never have to go read Fukaya, you know, FOOO or anything like that to do this. You just, Rolfson will get you through. Rolfson and plenty of time will get you through that calculation. Okay. Yeah, that seems fair. I guess I, I was wondering like if, there's some trick that you can do with just like looking at the mapping class group of S2 with four punctures and like you automatically getting an answer without, uh, you know, much work. Oh uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, I can say this, that if you look at this, uh, Chris and I wrote this up a couple, um, a little while ago, but if you take any surface cross eye, including punctured surfaces, and you take a curve on the surface and push it in and do a holonomy perturbation on that pushed in curve, you can actually reinterpret that just as a Hamiltonian isotopy on the character variety of the boundary, the special kind called a, a Goldman twist flow. So the, the, yes, the mapping class group, you can, you can use that to study how the mapping class group. So for example, if your goal was to take a product tangle, two puncture two sphere, and then maybe glue them together to get something, and and try to get some sort of gluing TQFT. You can do that, uh, but uh, the issue of perturbations is tricky. You know, you have to find all your incompressible annuli, and then this other condition I said about the curves have to have a nice property with respect to the holonomy. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well. Still a lot of people online. Are there other questions? Okay. Well, we can thank Paul again. I'll leave it over a little bit in case somebody.